Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fare from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films we can get our hands on and invite you to tag along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature grindhouse style where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise. At the end of each episode, along with our honorary Sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon. You know you want to hear us talk about money plane. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> we decide on all the official ratings and rankings for every film that we cover. Patreon Money subscribers plans. also get an honor shout out and two bonus episodes every single month, which we have been doing for over two years. So there is something oh, like yeah. 60 plus bonus episodes waiting for you, as well as our bonus transmission series, which Jamie was alluding to, where we talk about <laughs> new release genre movies, which we are in short supply of right now. So oh, yeah. yes, we are. We are hitting every direct to video thing that we can possibly hit on that series. The uh, Lawrence the Brothers listeners. <laughs> well, you guys don't want to watch Sonic again? No. <laughs> it no, won't leave the theater. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, speaking of which, we did have a lot of patrons make the jump uh, this week. So, we are going to shout them out now. We had Nestor Trujillo. We had Matt Barry. Uh, Nick. Just Nick. Uh, Will DC. Matthew White. William Highland. Uh, Jeffrey Burling, Jerry Eldred, Harrison O'Clair, uh, just Zach, nice. Patrick Clausen, and hold on, I'm still scrolling. Holy crap, we're still going here. Uh, Primrose Path, L. Repugnant, <laughs> uh, Sivat Zur, Daniel, Dog Guy. I think I think Dog Guy has been signed up before. Welcome back, Dog Guy. <laughs> Ryan <laughs> Fallon, Love Leo you, Patrick guy. Monroe, <laughs> Vic Vaughn, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Hayden Michael Cole, Chase Palumbo, um, Hijalmar W, and I think that's it. I think that's everyone. I might have even doubled up on some people there. I just didn't want to miss anyone. Uh, oh, thanks so awesome. much to all of you guys for signing up. We have had a yeah. lot of sign-ups recently, and we really appreciate that. Um, that's the main plug for the week. The other plug, as always, is Apple Podcasts. If you guys are listening on Apple Podcasts, I know you are. I see the stats. Uh, scroll down to the very bottom and give us a good old rating and review down there. It helps us climb the ranks over at iTunes and find new listeners that way, and we appreciate that as well. Uh, but that being said, I think those are all the plugs. Uh, welcome back. Uh, as always, I am your host, Josh Lewis, and joining me uh, is my co-host... Jamie Miller. Welcome back, everybody. We are back uh, for another week, calling in from the quarantine zone still. That's it's right. Been months. We're chilling. We're still talking, still here, still talking gross movies. Uh, right. I think two weeks ago would have been the last time you guys, free listeners, would have heard from us. And we were talking uh, 90s cosmic horror starring Sam Neill. Very specific sub- subgenre of movie <laughs> that included John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness um, and Paul W.S. Anderson's Event Horizon. Both movies where Sam Neill's face gets all fucked up. Oh, yeah. Lots of screaming, <laughs> lots of waking up from nightmares. It's great. Yep, we had a great time talking about those two with uh, special guest Brianna Ziegler, um, and we followed that episode up with a more sort of uh, possession uh, horror films, this time of child possession, though, and we talked um, Exorcist II, The Heretic by John Borman, kind of the notoriously uh, hated Exorcist sequel yeah. that is like... <laughs> kind of fun if you take it on its own wavelength as a bizarre psychodrama uh, with yeah. uh, James Earl Jones in like a full locust outfit and <laughs> uh, Linda Blair uh-huh. like entering people's minds via like therapy or something. Very strange movie. We had a great time with it though. And we also talked about um, an even stranger and- movie. Even, one of the weirdest movies I think we've ever talked about, uh, Giuliano Paradisi's The Visitor from 1979. 
which had Lance Henriksen as a satanic basketball team owner in <laughs> Atlanta who's trying to Rosemary's baby his girlfriend so that he has a little satanic brother for his daughter who is sort of like already like an omen type figure and then there's a whole subplot about franco nero as space jesus trying to prevent this from happening and it actually stars also john houston as one of his uh franco space franco nero's uh disciples who gets sent to earth to try to like stop this whole thing from happening. Meanwhile, Glenn Ford, uh, one of the sort of classic noir actors from things like The Big Heat, is trying to investigate it. And 90% of the violence in that movie happens due to birds attacking people. Just a strange movie. Yeah, one Um, of the weirdest things we've ever covered, for sure. I have to see this. (laughs) So so if you want to hear that episode, that was uh, patreon.com slash podcast. That was last week's bonus episode, and it was a bizarre one for sure. (laughs) Uh, But this week, uh, moving on here, we're we're kind of pivoting away from child possession (laughs) a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit. (laughs) And uh, we are going to talk a little bit about For the first time, we're going to talk about some boxing movies this week. And to do so, we have a special guest, uh, Rocky, or as some of you might know him on Twitter, Viperwave. Rocky, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm here to talk about boxing. Hell (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. No, I I, I follow Rocky on Letterboxd, and judging by a lot of the things that he was logging, I was like, okay, we got to get this guy on the show. He likes a lot (laughs) of the same stuff that we like. Um, And uh, also... He wanted to bring on a Shinya Tsukamoto movie, which we can never turn down. Cause, Absolutely. Uh, like, Absolutely. You gotta go down that rabbit hole. Exactly. Uh, so, Rocky, what two films have you brought with you this week, and why do they pair together? Well, I brought... The first movie is uh, John Huston's Fat City, which is about small-time boxers in the town of Stockton, California. And uh, unlike, you know, for example, Scorsese's Raging Bull, which is this very big, grandiose boxing movie, this movie's very minimal. It actually barely has any boxing in it, and uh, <laughs> a lot of it is just about a study of character, and uh, all takes place in conversations. And it's directed by John Huston, one of the great American directors. He made uh, The Maltese Falcon, The African Queen, uh, what other ones, Treasure of Sierra Madre. He was also oh, an actor. Well, yeah, and, and we, we thought it was really funny that we accidentally did The Visitor, which was like an Italian <laughs> horror movie that <laughs> starred John together. Huston for no reason. And then we and, were like, and and next week we're going to... such a weird role, too. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and he did it seven years after directing this film, so we were just like really strange wow. kind of late career that he had there. Um, but we were super glad to talk about him again because we have covered Maltese Falcon um, on this show, and we we like John Huston a lot. Yeah. Um, but the 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 other film, Shinya oh. Tsukamoto. This is uh, Tokyo Fist, which is the uh, kind of the second step into his filmography after Tetsuo that I recommend people take. This one's all about uh salary man who leads a very average life until one day he is uh, cuckolded <laughs> by his uh, former high school friend and uh, his wife turns out to be a freak and a lot of a lot of weird shit happens in this one. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> that's basically all that you can do to sum up a Shinya Tsukamoto film half the time because we actually a bunch of weird uh, shit happens yeah yeah, we, yeah. We, we hadn't seen anything by him until we decided to do Tetsuo the Iron Man on the show, and then we watched that, and it basically blew our minds. It's probably one of the top five films we've like watched on the show for the first time and just been completely blown away by that and like yeah. what, like the devil's seconds. Yeah. like It joins the ranks there for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Tetsuo is my favorite movie, I think, if I had to pick one. It's just absolutely One of amazing. my favorites, for sure. Mm-hmm. And, you could and, never find it in good quality for a long time. I remember you just had th- just the shittiest quality, but now it's on Blu-ray and it just looks amazing. So, hell yeah, yeah, I know. I'm I, glad this, people this... respect it so much that that would happen because uh, mm. it deserves it for sure. Well, yeah, and they just released that whole box set of like all of his stuff. So that was how I ju- that was how I watched uh, Tokyo Fist, and I actually caught up on basically everything I hadn't seen in the box. So I watched like. 
uh, Bullet Ballet, A Snake of yep. June, Hayes, uh, all kinds of stuff. Hayes was like really interesting too because that was him doing like sort of like a saw esque like dude wakes up like trapped in like a steel compartment and spends oh, the whole cool. movie just like wow. covered in like gross textures like trying to get his way out. Um, so he's had a really interesting career and yeah, Tokyo Fist, I think is his main feature that he hit just after doing the first Tetsuo film. So we're actually going in chronological order oh, with Shinya Sukamoto right now. I think, he, well, you you missed Tetsuo 2, Body Hammer. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, well, that's what I meant. I meant uh, both films cause we actually did cover Tetsuo 2, Body oh, Hammer. Oh, you did? Oh, well. great, great. Um, which was a great time. Yeah, we did that. And what, what else did Perry bring on with that? He brought another weird one with that, that I can't remember exactly what it was, but that was was, was uh, that when he paired Akira, or was that a different episode? I think it was. I think it, I think was, it was Akira and Tetsuo Two Body Hammer. Yeah, we went like full like cyberpunk body horror grotesquerie kind of deal, and oh, that yeah. one got like way more sexual and perverse. That's <laughs> <laughs> that kind of than, movie than even the first one, which has a dude's like penis turn into a drill. <laughs> the drill. Well, <laughs> that yeah, well, image he has will a never budget this time. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's the mainstay of a lot of his movies is uh, penises not working the way they should. <laughs> Hell yeah. So stick around for uh, the discussion on Tokyo Fist, because if you want to know what uh, Shinya Tsukamoto makes of a boxing movie, we'll say that it's very different than Fat City. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, very, very different. But uh, that being said, I think we're going to jump it right into it here. We're going to do these ones chronologically, I think. So we are going to start here with... Fat city. And it's bad to be alone. There are some women that love you for yourself, but that doesn't last long. Help me make it through the night. If you want to win bad enough, you win. There ain't no way in hell this dude's going to beat me because he's too old, I'm too fast, I'm going to be all over him. I'm going to kick his ass so bad every time he takes a bite of food tomorrow, he's going to think of me. He's going to know he's been in the fight because I'm going to hit him with everything. I'm not just going to beat that mother. I'm going to kill him. I don't want to be alone. Poor bastard. Help me make it through the night. All right, we are talking Fat City, the 1972 American boxing drama film directed by John Houston. Uh, the film stars Stacey Keach, Jeff Bridges, and Susan Tyrell in kind of what is like sort of like I guess what you would call like a like a three piece um, uh, drama thing. This could have almost been a play. I, I oh imagine. yeah, for sure. very um, play like yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, it is based on a boxing novel of the same name by uh, a writer who didn't seem to really go on to do much more, but he did also write the screenplay for this, um, and his name was Leonard um, Gardner. This was a very late career turn for John Huston, who was obviously known for directing a lot of films with Humphrey Bogart in the sort of like 40s and and into the 50s. Um, And sort of into like the the 60s and 70s, he was kind of like a for hire um, genre guy a a, a little bit. Um, And this was like really late in in his career to the and how old he was. He was over 60 years old at this point. Mm-hmm. Late 60s. You would not believe it watching this movie because it does not feel like it was made by a man in his late 60s. No, it, it feels like John Huston like getting involved in kind of like that that new Hollywood uh, sort of like really depressing drama. And there is like a world weariness to it that you do feel like an older man might have been involved in. But like stylistically, this is looks nothing like basically anything that he had done previously. Oh. <laughs> yeah, very, very low key. This, this does seem like the kind of film that, you know, sort of like the Scorsese's of the world were trying to make um, around this time. And he was kind of making what sort of like the young new filmmakers were doing. Um, and also he was casting like sort of like young up and comers, like people like Stacey Keach and Jeff Bridges, who, you know, Jeff Bridges would have just been in Last Picture Show. And Stacey Keach, I'm trying to remember at this time, I can't even think he must have been like a really new actor at, at this point. I can't think of any leading role I've seen him in before this except for no i can't think of one i was like i've seen him in slave of the cannibal god he was in like the long riders uh in the late 70s i think the main thing we've seen him in jamie we did road games on the show from 1981 which is an amazing right. film that's yeah. a that, great one yeah. but that's like a full decade after this yeah uh, <laughs> what i know that's 81 from, isn't it yeah. Uh, yeah when it comes to more modern films is like american history x uh machete and unfortunately he wasn't <laughs> gaudy that kind of sucks, but oh, uh, damn. <laughs> but what are you gonna do? He's still a great actor. 
Yeah, so 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 Fat City, I think, has to be one of his his earliest sort of like leading roles, and uh, what a leading role because it's this is a really really sad. Oh yeah, slow, it's uh, so. And he has <laughs> he has such a like he plays the character with such a, with such hope, even though throughout the movie we see him, you know, he's even at his his uh, his day job where he's I think like picking cucumbers or whatever. He's he's drinking <laughs> yep. whiskey in the hot sun and hot and sun. just. Uh, <laughs> It's just, it's sad. And he's also saying things like, you know, I, I also get to work on my, my, uh, my, my physical fitness while I do the job as well. And then he just takes a big swig of Jack Daniels or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, and he's, he's going to get back into it. He's right. going to get it's, back right. into fighting. Yeah, just, every scene is, I'm going to get back into it. I'm going to get back into it. And, <laughs> and, and at first, you, you kind of feel that hope, even though, you know, the movie opens with the guy waking up, the first thing he does is put a cigarette in his mouth, the whiskey's beside him, you know, oh. like, it's, it's it, it right away establishes a very sad and, and poor man, um, but you mm-hmm. you have that kind of, like, that fight for him, where you're like, come on, just just please get it together and, and, and get it done, but instead it's mostly just, mostly just talk. A lot of the time. Yeah, well, and and and, yeah. and that that opening montage of him getting ready for you know the the day's events um, mm-hmm. has like a really sad like Chris Christopherson like country ballad where he's yeah. singing about how like yesterday is dead and gone and tomorrow's out of sight. Uh, it's sad to be alone. Help me make it through the night. <laughs> oh, right, <laughs> and I love that. I love that shot in the opening when he, you know, he goes down the apartment stairs, puts the cigarette in his mouth, and uh, and it's this it's this nice shot where he's directly in the middle, and he does this little like dance, little this jig, little yeah. Groove. And and I, once again, it's kind of his character like trying to bring out some type of you know, life and happiness out of the situation he's in. I feel like so he is a fighter, you know, he really is. Yeah. Um, it's he just, goes it's back still inside. Sad. <laughs> he gets his bag and you see all the beer cans in the bin and it's just like, oh. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, like this, this film has like a very like implied history to it. And even though it like yeah. moves kind of like a, a sort of like slow moving, almost like a drifter vibe to it. And it's very kind of like slice of life kind of drama of just sort of like poor people making it kind of day to day. Um, and it, it, boxing movies a lot of the time are kind of used frequently as class dramas because it just is a kind of like relatively cheap sport to get into. Like you buy the gloves, you get a gym membership and you train your body. That's really all you need to like right. get into boxing. And, and kind of like the dream is that, you know, you get into these very high priced fights and it's a very quick, like, um, rags to riches kind of like, uh, dream sport in that kind of way. I mean, like yeah. R- Rocky would literally win best picture, like what, like three or four years after this came out. Yeah. Um, so like th- that's, that's the, what boxing was a lot of times sort of used for and, and boxing a lot of time too, I mean, they they can be made into like a really good sports movie just because it's kind of like a very cinematic sport, just like the movement and the pounding on the bodies and the way that it's sort of like connected to like these weary, sad people. Yeah, I think there's, <laughs> I think, I think there's something to be said too about like how how individual the uh, like boxing is. It's just based on one person, so I feel like it's yes. easy to when you're watching a movie like that. You know, the team sports they're 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 very uh, inspiring sometimes and all that because it's like the the boys getting together and getting it done or whatever. <laughs> but with an, with this kind of like individual sport, you can really lock in with somebody's emotions and what they're going through, just uh, mm-hmm. trying to get to the top, or or in this case, I guess, just trying to get back in the ring in general. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and, and one thing worth noting about this too is uh, John Houston was a California boxer in his youth. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Middleweight. That's awesome. Yeah, and apparently he was not a very good one. Uh, <laughs> so that's he, what this he, is about. That's what yeah. this is all about. <laughs> exactly. So 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 he did like twenty or twenty five like amateur professional fights they call them, which is like basically what the kind of fights that he's doing here, where they are paid fights. So it is a professional fight, but it's like on the lower end of professional fighting. Right. And obviously That's John I, yeah. Houston, also a well-known uh, drinker. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, it's all coming together. Yeah. It's all in the yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah, so, so so you can see why maybe he latched on to this particular material and why he was able to maybe get into these characters' heads a little bit. Because like very loosely, Stacey Keach plays like an, an, an aging uh, former 
boxer who, you know, obviously Jamie mentioned that he, you know, does a lot of, uh, he can't really hold the job. So he does a lot of temp work, um, working yeah. with a lot of like, uh, migrant workers, um, on like farms and, and, and such like that, basically just to afford his drinking habit for the most part. Cause he doesn't even really seem like he has like a, a decent place to say he's always trying to like, uh, <laughs> stay with other people, uh, in, in certain scenes. Um, and basically one day while he's working out, he meets Jeff Bridges, who is kind of like a young up and comer. And he kind of sees him a little bit as a younger version of himself. And he's like, you know what, you should get into fighting and you should, you know, start using your body. You shouldn't waste your prime years. Like I kind of felt like I did. And the, the really sort of unique part about this because it's not really like a like a an unconventional story in in that matter but what is unconventional about it is just that everyone kind of fails and everyone kind of sucks like you would think that there would be a story about how jeff you know he maybe he trains jeff bridges this younger version of himself to be like the next great fighter and he lives through you know this younger fighter who goes on to be great and he's like i have achieved something through this younger surrogate but jeff bridges (laughs) kind of just fucking sucks and he just loses (laughs) he just loses twice like the second fight where he just gets knocked out in 20 seconds (laughs) Yeah, I also love the uh, the little. Uh, there's a scene where I think it's the first time that Jeff Bridges gets uh, gets beaten, and he goes back to the to the locker room, and the, the he the, takes off the, his trunks, takes- and then the coach just gives it to the next guy, and and the guy's <laughs> like, he's like, "There's blood on these coach," and the and the coach is like, "Well, it's not your blood, so don't worry about it." Yeah, and so get it's in there, this, son. It's this constant like the it, it, even though they all suck you have these coaches too that are that are making them just keep going like kind of kind of giving them this false hope a lot of the time it seems uh, and it seems to make money which is also a very sad thing like they even mentioned at one point that Jeff Bridges is a is a white kid so he'll be able to make them more boxing sales on the tickets mm-hmm. and things like yep. that so there's all this like corruption around uh just the kids that are only there because they're uh, you know, just very interested in the sport and a lot of the time also poor. So that's the only thing that they could get into. Well, yeah. And, and they have young bodies. That's the main thing. Of course. Like, you know, like the, the, the older coach, um, who works with, uh, Stacy Keach, like he's been in the game so long that he trained Stacy Keach. (laughs) <laughs> right, right, yeah. and, and 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 so and it's so funny because he says he had such a bad experience like with that trainer, and he think he blames you know his last fight that kind of got him out of the game on him, but then he sends Jeff Bridges to him kind of like anyway. Um, so then you kind of just have like these old dudes trying to like relive like their their shot that they had through this young guy and basically like destroying his body in the process and weaponizing his need for money to get him, get him into it. So it just turns into like this really sad thing about like, you know, a sport that kind of like destroys your body and Stacy Keach, you know, uh, he kind of has like that scar on his face already just as an actor. And he basically, he plays him very weary, but he looks like he's been like through Through some shit. Oh, he's Yeah. (laughs) There's Absolutely. that terrific scene where they're sitting in the bar after the fight and they're like the two young boxers faces are just bashed up and the coach is just like, yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You did great. <laughs> it's just like, You're doing great, kid. Uh. Yeah, look at my face. <laughs> yeah. So they, they, they kind of you you get an idea through sort of like the scenes that this has been going on for decades and they keep just finding new kids and they keep pounding them not actually making them very much money and then they become drinkers and temp workers like Stacy Keach and that there's almost like a, a whole cycle of um you know kind of how this uh industry works um yeah because eventually then, we even have Jeff Bridges joining him in the fields and stuff like that right yeah, yeah. because yeah. because Jeff Bridges uh I think gets a girl pregnant and realizes that he needs some money too. Yeah. Um so he starts doing the temp work until, you know, the boxing pays the bills is kind of like the idea. Um but obviously he just keeps getting absolutely demolished in every fight that he he does and then Stacy Keach, you know, decides at a certain point that he is going to get back into it. He is going to train. He believes that he's going to, you know, uh do it again. Um a little bit inspired by um the woman uh, Oma, played by Susan Tyrell, who uh, I don't know about you, Jamie, but this this 
absolutely depressed me and reminded me oh, of yeah. <laughs> the oh. old woman in uh, Pick Up on South Street. The, oh, where, yeah. where, you, where you just feel like uh, the Sam Fuller Helpless. noir film about sort of um, hus- street hustlers. Um, and there's an older woman street hustler in that film where just like the decades of manipulating people and being, you know, for scraps basically has kind of like caught up with her. And when an assassin basically comes to murder her in her bed uh, because of her relation to sort of like the main thief in that film, uh, she just yeah. welcomes it. Yeah, just and she has like a, <laughs> Yeah, she just has like a monologue where she's just like, I'm so fucking tired. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and the, you're you're just putting me out of my misery uh, at this point, and uh, those were the exact sort of vibes I got from <laughs> from from this woman who, oh yeah, St- Stacy Keach meets at a at a bar because she's also a, a a heavy drinker, and watching these two like sort of like drunk older people in the bar, they're like just being. Their romantic oh. scene, like where he oh. like smacks a jukebox and shit, like it's like, his head. like it's yeah, yeah, exactly, because it's 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 I think it's like this play on the the I guess meet cute at a bar scene that you'd see in the I don't know like the fifties or I don't know, but it, it, the jukebox thing is w- why I got that thought because mm-hmm. most of the time it's like that smooth guy that walks over, hits the jukebox, <laughs> the song starts, you know, he buys the girl a drink. But instead, what does Stacy Keach do? He smacks it with his head, and then yep. they just yell at each other, hammered for like five minutes, and then. Yep. then but at, like you know, one of the most romantic things they say to each other is something like, uh, "You're the only son of a bitch worth shit in this place," <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's like their their loving romantic uh, dialogue that they have between each other. And it's, just, oh. it's just oh my god, it's a. It is a wreck for sure. <laughs> she she just declares her love for him like after they get out of the bar and she can't get home. And she's yeah, just, right away. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> no time at all. It's uh it's yeah, it's a very very sad romance. That is for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, if and, you can and even com- call it that. Well, and they're they're yeah. comparing each other's like like sad histories with one another. Right. She's just like, yeah, my my first husband was shot and killed, and my new boyfriend had like like raped me, and he's just and like, that's I in was the married. First and five she, minutes of them yeah. meeting, like it's yeah. <laughs> God. And then and then he was like, yeah, well, my wife uh, ran out at me. It's just two old people like drunkenly airing their dirty laundry at each <laughs> other at the bar very loudly. <laughs> Yeah, um, very loudly. Yeah, and then and then she um, there, she implies like a history of abuse too, and and basically suggests like if it'll make you feel good, like like punch me because he told her to like <laughs> shut up or something like that because she was just going on drunkenly, and so then she's like egging him on to like beat the shit out of her, <laughs> and 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 that's and that's when he decides that he's going to smash his head on the jukebox, and she's so impressed by like this act of like self harm. <laughs> <laughs> and that she's kind of like, well, oh what would God. you do that for? Like the conviction in his body to like make that decision, I guess. And then he he does have this 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 line that I think is actually kind of romantic, where he says, um, "You can count on me to like do what I'll say." Basically, uh, yeah. and he was like, yeah. I he was like, I t- I told you if you you know uh, that I w- I would hit myself, and then I went and did it. And she is weirdly enough in her drunken haze, like very impressed by that, because like <laughs> here's a guy who just actually is like, hey, I won't hit you, and I will do what I say. That's the bare minimum <laughs> for her to be yeah, like. Yeah, <laughs> that's all you need. This is yeah. a good guy. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the things yeah. I yeah. It's one of the things I love about this movie is that it's a, like normally in films like Raging Bull when things are difficult, people kind of behave very badly towards each other. They're all shouting and punching each other, but in this one, <laughs> like the worse things get, the more people kind of struggle to be kind to each other. They're just trying to be nice the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> which I yeah. think is interesting. You know, Even though going through people. this like deteriorating hell, it's just uh, yeah. They're all just trying yeah, to be well, nice. Well, well, because then they go home and they try to play like the happy couple because her boyfriend right. ha- right, has right. been. I think I think he's been arrested and he's yeah. in jail now or something like that. And he has been in jail. Well, they were attacked because they're an interracial couple. Or I think I remember. Yes, yeah. yeah, I think that's what they what they say. Um, so they try to play out like a kind of like 
uh, domestic home life where like he tries to like cook her steak and peas and <laughs> they're both like lashing out at, at each other and every time someone tries to like say I'm sorry to the other <laughs> they like, basically sort of like do it backhandedly or they just piss it off each other even more and yeah. throughout most of the scene things just get broken and peas fall on the floor <laughs> and like this <laughs> I love the way love that the they way. like the, the, the interaction they have with the the dinner is is pretty interesting because at first it's it's Stacy who's trying to like just make her dinner and she's kind of uh, being very irritable and and talking I, I don't know I can't remember why she was what she was complaining about but she was going off and mm-hmm. and he's like okay well then I won't make you dinner and then she says she'll take it and then he says no you don't get to have it <laughs> and then she's like well now I want it and then so she takes it back and then he's and then he takes oh. it she starts eating it and he's and then he grabs it again and is like well you don't deserve it now and it's just this constant like uh, so then it starts falling everywhere yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and then and but then he th- then he feels bad that he like dropped it everywhere and then lets her have it but then he gets upset that she's not saying it's like amazing or she's not commenting on it and he's like how is it tell me how it is and she's like it's fine (laughs) (laughs) oh man it's just it's so it's so sad and and it feels so so helpless and and susan tyrell man she just gives it you know like there there isn't uh there isn't a lot of of dignity left in her character by the end um and that kind of commitment is is just I'm ve- I'm just very impressed by it. Like it, it, a hell of a performance by mm-hmm. her. She just lays it all out and yeah, she actually got nominated for best supporting actress. Oh for wow! This role well, at the Oscars. Hell yeah, she definitely <laughs> deserves it. It was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Well, I really and, haven't and seen this uh, like this kind of distraught performance like this uh, maybe since that that uh, pickup on Southside that you mentioned. Well, it's it's very similar just in terms of, of the vibe of the scenes where it's it really is just people who have just been barely surviving day to day. And there's an implied history that they've been doing this for like decades. Yeah. And it's just like now they just sit around and get drunk and yell at each other to like feel something or to like sort of replicate the sort of like domestic fights that they've seen before or like, you know, just to to have something to look forward to. And she even tries to tell him like, you know, you're not like a terrible looking guy. If you like, you know, didn't dress like a bum (laughs) or whatever, (laughs) I bet you could get a job that you like. And then he's just like, there hasn't been a job I really like. It hasn't been invented yet. Um, mm. Other other than boxing, and which inspires him to get back into the ring. And when when he get in the third act, when he gets back into the ring, there is sort of like this underdog element where he's going to get back in and he's going to win. But the way that Houston again um, sort of like shoots this, there's an amazing sort of completely silent sequence that basically won me over and basically made me like almost like weep, which is that scene where the other boxer um basically travels to the venue because the 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 trainer gets Stacy Keach a fight you know they 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 get him you know relatively back in shape as much as they can get him back in shape for the fight and they have this Puerto Rican boxer boxer played by Sixto Rodriguez who is completely silent as he pulls up in his suit and his uh, briefcase, and there's a series of silent montages of him just, like, you know, getting ready. Um, we get one glimpse that um, he goes over to, uh, like, pee, and he pees blood. So we know that this right. is, like, uh, like, a, like, a very sick, dying man who's basically, you know, making the little bit of money that he can. Because we know how much money they get for the fight. It's not very much. And you know um, those are most li- likely from, uh, I think, body shots, too. Because I think you get that mm-hmm. from, like, the kidney shots a lot of the time. Yeah. So all, like, when you watch that fight and you see every time that Stacy pulls off a body shot, you actually feel for the other guy, even though the only context we've had is that, mm-hmm. that peeing scene. Uh, which yeah, I thought well, was pretty be- cool, too. Just that they can translate be- that kind of thing to a character mm-hmm. we don't know at all. Yeah, because there's just a, there's a whole periphery implied 
history that here's a whole nother fucking dude. You could have had a movie about this dude. Right. Who is just traveling and he's in the same boat. So all of a sudden people are paying to watch just like two like dying men kill each just other. beat the shit out of each just, other. And, yeah. and, 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 and Stacy Keach actually has a hard time even beating this sick old man. And he doesn't even know that he's a sick old man. It's, right. it, it, it's, it's, it's just we something know. that we're clued into as, as the audience. And so and, and it he, feels like even the, the fight itself feels like it has a complete lack of, you know, that, that, that spectacle. Finesse, yeah. That fina- yeah. It's right. Just, yeah. Like, They're it's just wailing filled. on each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not filmed like in a like a Rocky movie where you have those really cool shots of the slow mo hit and all that stuff. It's really mm-hmm. just like you have the shots inside the the boxing ring, and that's just dudes just wailing on each other. And there's no mm-hmm. like there's no real uh, like like I said, the, no spectacle to it. And then they have one other shot that's just outside the ring, and it kind of shows you what it's like from the audience perspective where you don't even really hear the hits or anything like that <laughs> yeah and it's yep. just it's just two guys wailing on each other and there's this l- real lack of like cinematic emotion which is on purpose and i really really liked it yeah like it's like it's, it's not exciting it, it really right. does just like level yeah. with you that like these are two old weary people basically just trying to kill each other <laughs> yeah. for like yeah. for like scraps because by the end of the fight Stacy Keach you know g- gets in the car with his trainer and he's like you know how much how much do I get and he gets a hundred bucks it's implied partially because he he owed owes him the money. trainer money yeah. still so he took that out of it but he did it all for a hundred bucks and he's just like look I hurt my body so bad I'm not going to be able to fight for like another month or two Right. And like a hundred bucks isn't going to get me through that. And then you realize that the other guy who is filmed uh, leaving again, he, he leaves with his dignity, but basically he just puts his suit back on his and his and his briefcase and he walks out in like these very shadowy, like unlit halls. And that's the last we see of him, of him just walking out, making as the loser, probably not making any money. Yeah. And so then you realize that that is like the the existence and, and the dream is like at best you're gonna get you know underpaid <laughs> yeah. to kill yourself kicked out of you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and i yeah. think even like there's a i think at the end of the fight i'm pretty sure uh stacy says something like like it's like did i get knocked down and then the the one guy says tells him that he won so he's not even aware you know like he, he at a certain <laughs> point the the fight is is such a just a mess that that he mm-hmm. can't even really understand if he won or not until someone tells him like yeah no you won you didn't get knocked down you're good <laughs> like you're in such a daze that you can't even enjoy the victory as mm-hmm. well the moment well, yeah, right it, the punch because it, it, it's literally you just get shoved in there and you kind of just like flail around as much as you suggest kind of like otherwise and you like <laughs> yeah. train for yeah, it for and it. like the one the one dude too one of the kids early on who gets who ends up later getting the shit like. He ends up losing his fight pretty badly. He's one of the kids who's like all bruised up in like that uh, that the table bar conversation, scene, yeah. the bar scene that Rocky was bringing up. But before that scene, when he's getting prepped with like Jeff Bridges, um, he's kind of like talking about you know you got to believe in yourself to win. You got to have the will to win. You got to taste it. Right. You gotta you gotta not beat the man. You gotta kill the man. <laughs> he's like yeah, he's, got yeah. he's like hyping, hyping himself up. <laughs> And Jeff, uh, Jeff Bridges is like, yeah, I know. I'm going to go out there and do my best, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to – these early Jeff Bridges roles, I haven't seen a lot of them. We've been doing a lot of them on the show recently because we actually yeah. had um, Josh Trank on um, oh. when, when Capone came out. And we had him on, and he wanted to talk about a film that really inspires him. Um, which was uh, the Western Bad Company, which uh, sort of similar to Last Picture Show, he plays like a really th- sort of like thorny teenage character who's forced to like grow up like a little too fast. Yeah. Um, and in this, you have him playing kind of like a similar role. This was seemingly like what he was sort of typecast at the time, but it all leads to like a really beautiful scene between the two at the bar at the end, where Stacy Keach, um, you know, fully acknowledges that he was kind of projecting his younger self onto this onto this young guy who uh i think he decides that he's not going to box anymore and he's just going to try and make do with like the temp work and just try to like pay uh basically afford to you know um take care of his girlfriend and and his child that's on the way and jeff and jeff and uh skeech like begs him to like 
just go for a drink with him because he's so pissed off and he's so uh, he's he basically <laughs> blows the hundred dollars he makes on the fight drinking. Yeah, yeah. and he just <laughs> lost uh, Oma, I believe, too, because yes. uh, oh, her boyfriend that comes, scene. Back, comes back. Yeah. yeah. Where he talks to the boyfriend and Oma's just yelling in the background and the boyfriend's just like, yeah, I just ignore. That's how I do it. <laughs> yeah, she had a oh, shitty man. life. I just, I just don't pay her any mind. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, it's so sad. It's just, Everything oh. about this is just the most depressing thing ever, including this ending, you know, the bar ending. Yeah, yeah oh. when, they, when, they're, when they're just sitting there at the bar and you're thinking that like, Again, this this film sort of like divide or defies like any sort of like dramatic satisfaction from these sort of like character arcs, and we basically just end up where they kind of were at the beginning. Just their the little bit of hope that we kind of saw that they had at the beginning, where they were like you know working on their bodies and they were you know trying to make a little bit of money and they had dreams of getting into the ring and making more money. Like all of those hopes throughout the course of you know sort of like the ninety minutes have been dashed, That's completely the f- eradicated. Um, so now it's just they sit at uh, a bar and drink. And I I think he even just gets the one uh, he gets Jeff Bridges just a coffee. I think because he can't convince him yeah. to <laughs> get 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 drunk with him. So he's like at the very least just have a coffee with me or something. Yeah. And he gets this really sad sort of like line where uh, he says, before you can even get your life uh, rolling, it it makes a beeline for uh, the drain. And they're talking about the the guy who is tending the diner or the bar there. And what's the line that he has, Jamie? I think you put it in your review. Oh, it's a, you think he was ever young once. (laughs) <laughs> and it, and it's like it, that it's it, it's like this eerie thing to me in a way cuz um i don't it's like they're saying you know that this guy had to end up here somehow and but mm-hmm. you can't imagine it because he's just such an old man now and it's like you know he had so many years so and i think they're kind of realizing that this might be what they how they end up as well so yeah. mm-hmm. it's just seeing like you ever think he was w- young once and i think that's implying like do you ever think he had a chance to turn it around or did you ever, Mm -hmm. you know, did he ever have opportunities that would have led him in a different way or something like that? And they're just kind Mm -hmm. of just, you know, thinking back on all maybe the decisions they've made. And, and I I guess Jeff Bridges isn't necessarily saying that. I think Stacy's the one that says the line. So I think he's the one really having all the, he he just looks beaten by the end. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, He's definitely having an existential crisis. A hundred percent looking at that old (laughs) man pouring coffee. Um, But but also the thing about the Jeff Bridges character there too, though, is that it's very heavily implied that Jeff Bridges is basically going to be Stacy Keach in 20 years. Yeah. And that, and that basically, you know, he became a failed fighter. He's doing the same temp work already. Right. So it's so there there is like this sense that like Jeff Bridges doesn't even though he's young and you know um, he's like twenty he, I think he 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 has he has more he has time more. ahead of him. It's very unlikely that he there's a scenario where he sort of like escapes Stacy Keach's feet. And I think um, uh, Jeff Bridges sort of replies to him with a little bit more optimism and says, "Well, you know, maybe he's happy." And Stacy Keach says, "Maybe we're all happy." <laughs> uh, because damn. because obviously we know that uh, due to how depressing the film is that obviously Stacy Keach isn't happy but he is hitting the idea that like maybe this is as happy as he's ever going to be and this is as far as they're ever going to get which so sort of just br- accept it <laughs> yeah which kind yeah. of brings you back to the the title of of Fat City which Leonard Gardner the novelist basically said was um, sort of like a slang term for you know sort of like this idea of finding success it was like this crazy success um and this goal that um everyone sort of deluded themselves into thinking that they were going to achieve and that you weren't ever really going to reach um and that's definitely the feeling that you're kind of left with is that you know the movie opens and closes on them being sort of sad and weary and drunk (laughs) and uh all that happens in the middle is that they kind of hope that one day they won't be. And, uh, by the end they're kind of like, well, I guess not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday is well dead and gone. Kind of enjoy it, I guess. 
Yeah, this yeah, is, and then and then uh, the Chris Christopherson this is, song. This is comes a film I in. really want to revisit in like my mid thirties and see how I feel. About <laughs> it. <laughs> Just be like, yep. Oh man, I also like the way that uh, that Houston does this as well at the end when when uh, Stacy turns around and time freezes basically, like everything mm-hmm. goes silent and he just watches the old men with friends, and I think realizes that he might not even get that. Like, he might not even yep. get the, I'm going to at least be able to sit at a table with my old buddies and just play cards or whatever the hell they're playing. Uh, yeah. and, and so when he turns around and says, you know, just talk a while with me to Jeff Bridges, and then they say nothing. <laughs> yeah, I, the, I the credits like, roll. Give me, give me, like, how was your day? <laughs> you know, give me, like, <laughs> give me something for these characters. Instead, you're saying talk a while, give me no dialogue, which would imply that there's really nothing that these two had together at all. There's, really. and, and there's nothing to, there's nothing to say about the experience. Right. Anymore. Like, yeah. And, and so you it's just, just, hear just, all it is is a dialogue. man. Yeah. All it is is a man just asking another man to sit by him and drink <laughs> the coffee so that he at least doesn't feel completely alone. alone. It's just yep. so fucking depressing in the best way, <laughs> in the best possible way. But my God, just so, so depressing. Well, yeah, and, and, that, and, that, and that's why it plays the Chris Christopherson song again there, because, again, it's, it's yesterday is dead and gone, tomorrow's out of sight. Yeah. It's sad to be alone. Help me make it through the night. He's literally just <laughs> asking for a dude to be like, oh. tomorrow and yesterday both sucked. Please just stay with me right now for a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's brutal. Oh, just brutal. Oh, yeah. Man. One of movie. the most Love like, it, though. brutal sports dramas that I've that I've I've seen, and it's hardly a sports drama. It's just like <laughs> yeah, not a lot just, of sports in it, really. It's it's just sad, lonely people realizing that they're going to be sad and lonely and stuck like where they are, <laughs> like forever. There's a part literally where Jeff Bridges just gets stuck in the mud for like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. right. It's he's brutal. just falling into the mud over. <laughs> he's like, "Don't touch me! I got mud all over me." <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. Uh, so pivoting towards the reductive rating round on this one, which for you, Rocky, is where we remove all the words, all the nuance, and uh, give the movie, uh, for our own ranking purposes, a uh, number between uh, one and, and five. Um, but it's also become sort of like uh, uh, final statements, or if there's any lines or scenes that we didn't hit. I think we did this one pretty well, but um, if there's anything else you, you wanted to say about it, we also say it here. But for me, this gets a really solid... I think, I honestly, I think this one gets the high for... Um, from me, this yeah. movie made me really sad, and we made it for all the reasons that we said. But I, I do think that Houston, the way that he sort of de- defies the conventions of a of a underdog sports movie, and just removes any sort of dramatic satisfaction from it, because these are all very sad, lonely people who try their best to kind of have day to day hope, and it just gets every sort of like real, um, I guess, sort of day-to-day reality of both sort of like the industry that they're in and kind of just being poor in in California um, just dashes away any hope that they have and they basically just try to drink it away and keep each other company through the the devastating time that they're all having and every sort of like implied little glance we get at the periphery of everyone's stories here including Susan Tyrell and including sort of like the the boxer that, that he even beats like there's no glory in even beating that guy it's just like yeah. there's another here's another sad, lonely, sick man who just had his body even more destroyed to make no money. And Stacy Keach did it for a hundred bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and so so like this is this is not really a sports drama as much as it really is just a flat out, like depressing, <laughs> uh like class based alcoholism. I don't even know. This movie just depressed the fuck out of me. That's all yeah. I can really say. Like, yeah. it's, it, it, it really is just empty people given nothing and holding on to incredibly small gestures of 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 hope. And at the end, it really is just a man looking at a mirror image of himself and is like, "Just make me less lonely." Yeah, that's it. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm right there with you. I'm uh, gonna give it the four as well. Um, 
I don't have to, I don't have too much to add. I do feel like uh, like <laughs> there is like a missing three seconds that they 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 fade away to the credits before it happens. But I feel like Stacy Keach does just look over to Jeff Bridges and be like, uh, "Would you hold me?" You know, something like that. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's it's yeah, one it's, of the most, uh, the most depressing sports dramas I've ever seen. And like you said, Josh, it's it it is really barely a sports drama. I mean. You know the the even the boxing scenes don't have any glory to them or or spectacle or anything like that. It's just sad, even when they're fighting. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, four out of five. Um, and just if you want to get sad, watch this movie. Absolutely. Hell yeah, for you, Rocky. Uh, I give it the four out of five. I think it's just it's remarkable how humane it is, and it's mm-hmm. just it's the kind of dialogue you don't really hear in movies anymore. Mm-hmm. It's like realistic. It's so full of character, and it's such a bleak movie, but it's it's got a humanity to it. Yeah, the acting is sure, yeah. terrific. It's beautifully filmed. It's just yeah, <laughs> it's it's just a very sad film. Yeah, <laughs> of very very sad people, and I just think it's remarkable in that element. I love how just completely understated it all is. It just never all the beats for the like the plot that you see in sports movies there, but it just never. It never kind of leans into the, what you expect. Yeah, it never has no. that never. fist pump moment ever. <laughs> oh no, the characters Not even just close never. To it. They never go anywhere. <laughs> they yeah. Just, yeah, nothing's gonna get better for they these. They just people. go back to the bar. Yep. Yeah, drink it away. I would be sometimes. <laughs> so 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 uh, very interesting to uh, uh, see see what John Houston was feeling uh, near yeah. the end of his career. Good lord. <laughs> I hope he himself was a little happier. Well, he had a really amazing sense of humor. His last movie that he made while he was dying of emphysema is called The Dead. So that's, that's a little <laughs> something for you. <laughs> wow. Amazing. I got to check that one out for sure. I can't yeah. believe he was still making movies up until the late 80s. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, that yeah, is. He had a huge career. Yeah. Um, but that'll wrap it up for uh, Fat City 1972. We're going to be right back and we're going to be talking about Tokyo Fish. <laughs> <笑>怖い。なんだか怖くて自分が。二人の男と一人の女の壮絶な愛の格闘技が始まった。東京フィスト。All right, we are back and we are talking Tokyo Fist, the 1995 uh, Japanese boxing horror film. Yeah. Uh, maybe the only boxing horror film uh, directed uh, by, obviously, Shinya Tsukumoto, the filmmaker behind all kinds of uh, strange Japanese body horror uh, films, including uh, two that we've covered on the show, Tetsuo the Iron Man, as well as, uh, I think we did Tetsuo 2, Body Hammer uh, as well. Oh. But he's had quite a long career. He's still making films uh, now. I saw at uh, TIFF two years ago, I got to see his his new samurai film, Killing, which is uh, him doing his, his typical frenzied, uh, and uncompromisingly sound designed, filled with scratching and screaming and all kinds of like <laughs> jolted, untethered, handheld photography and like bizarre expressionist uh, lighting and editing and all kinds of craziness applied to a samurai film. And today we're going to see that uh, with this film applied to a boxing film, which is kind of insane. And it works this film so just, well. Like, exists it's, at all. it's incredible. They just yeah. come right out of the gate with it. <laughs> Yeah, it, and yeah. it and it works so well. Like I, I, I didn't know that uh, that Shinya made a made a boxing movie. Um, and then it, it, I never thought that uh, he would do anything that's you know sports related or anything like that. But then I realized you know boxing realized, you know, and especially the way that you can film it, it works perfectly with his style. I mean that whole manic, crazy editing, the fast paced uh, movements. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it works perfectly, especially, especially when he's trying to accent the violence that takes place. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, what he also does is these over-the-top, like, body horror stuff. So that 
works very well when you have just people punching each other in the body and face throughout throughout the sport. So mm-hmm. yeah, it works and well. He, has, he, ha- he obviously has like a very kind of like dreamy style to him. Oh yeah. Um, sort of, sort of as well. And like when the film opens, it's a montage of people just like punching the air and punching the camera with like a, an absolutely um, insane, like pulsating, like pounding score by yeah, um, it's like industrial I, I or Chewy Shikawa, the late great Chewy Shikawa, Shikawa, who he yes. unfortunately passed away in 2017 of pancreatic cancer. Damn, and and yeah. it looks like he scored like pretty much every Shinya Sukamoto film, um, <sighs> as well as looking like he did a couple Takashi Miike films as 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 well. Oh, nice. Um, but yeah, this score here, I noticed because like I've I've noticed the sound design and the score in a lot of Sukamoto films, but I think this yeah. is like the one where it's like most merged like with the physical activity of obviously these people sort of like training and sort of like their feelings of sort of like rage and and inadequacy, and also in in typical Sukamoto fashion um sort of like a modern like industrialized uh japan um there's a lot of shots of like imposing low angle shots of skyscrapers and he loves like crumbling uh concrete and like rusted steel he loves like the textures and i mean like obviously that's mixed with the fleshy body horror in Tetsuo the iron man where like there's a literal transformation like into something sort of like mechanical right um this uh, this, sort of. This feels has, like has, he's de- like just destroying the body in general in this one, rather than a transformation. It almost feels like he's just watched like you're you're just watching bodies deteriorate. Mm-hmm. Like, well, and and they're they're definitely feeling sort of like trapped by their environments, which is sort of a connection to Fat City, where we also have characters trapped by their environments. But this one's just a little bit more sort of like literalized in like the tangible aspects of the film. Like it is literally they are trapped by these imposing structures all around them, right? And then they sort of try to express, you know, things that they these sort of like repressed feelings that they might have. Um, and boxing becomes sort of like an avenue in which to do that because this is partially based on Sukamoto's own experience working a, uh, a you know, becoming a, a strange primal animalistic boxer. Not sure. But he worked a <laughs> shitty nine to five job at an advertising firm apparently for, for several years. And just like the sort of like corporate office culture oh, yeah. and how people sort of like deny sort of like their real sort of feelings and bodily functions in sort of like that kind of environment is partially what inspired this, which is where you see sort of like an office guy become like a full out, like animalistic beast, uh, like at a certain point, uh, (laughs) ends up being sort of like the, the differing kind of transformation here. Um, but very loosely it is, uh, Shinya Tsukamoto. He's, uh, also the star of the film, I guess, which we should mention. And the other main star, um, is uh, his, I think it's his fiance, uh, played by Kaori Fuji, and then his brother, Koji mm. uh, Sukamoto, is oh, playing that's his brother. the old oh. high school friend. Yeah, his younger brother, which oh, very gives us cool. an even sort of like a w- bit of a weirder vibe to it when you think about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> strange, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he's a, a former high school friend who he kind of run, runs into, um, who is um, a, a fighter and has sort of has accessed his sort of like animalistic rage, which Im- impresses um, uh, Shinya's uh, fiance. Uh, at one point, he's just like flexing and he's mm. all sweaty and he's covered in amazing lighting. And she's like, look at those muscles. <laughs> um, Waking something within her, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> But uh, as is sort of like revealed a little bit uh, later in in the film, the reason this former high school friend sort of comes back into his life is because they once witnessed um, a friend of theirs uh, basically get uh, an an attempted rape and then uh, a murder of one of their friends. And they are so enraged about it that they decide they vow to each other that they are going to become fighters and that when those guys um who got sentenced uh to prison for the murder get out they are basically just going to like beat them into non-existence they are going (laughs) to like destroy their bodies and after a while um shinya sukamoto just uh character basically forgot about that vow 
And so that's why this guy comes back into his life and tries to activate his sort of like inner rage. And so when you realize that this film is just a series of Shinya Tsukamoto's younger brother just trying to piss him off, that's basically all. (laughs) That's all it is, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Trying to motivate him by cuckolding him. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And and, and activating a a, a primal side of his his wife as, as well who begins to sort of get into bodily mutilations including sort of like um uh piercing herself in all kinds of a myriad of ways With which thicker i don't know about thicker for, needles for, yeah. yeah and I, I was gonna say jamie did that not remind you of a uh, splatter naked blood a hundred percent the the japanese film where like a guy tries to invent a drug to sort of like cure people's like depression um, so that they don't have to like live in uh, misery anymore, and it turns misery into joy. And instead, what he finds out is that he's accidentally also made a physical component to it, where he has turned bodily harm and physical harm <laughs> into pleasure. So people literally start like uh, cooking themselves and eating themselves and piercing themselves because they are just they get some sort of like actual tangible pleasure out of it. And this actually has kind of like a similar aspect to it where sort of like the pain starts to become a way to like feel something in kind of like a modern dilapidated sort of like cityscape where it's like you don't really feel anything so instead this weird sort of like physical harm becomes a new expression uh in an almost sexual expression in a way yeah and at one point they even in that sense they even mix it with the uh with the the sex because there's that one shot of the 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 nipple piercing being just stretched oh and I was, that, just, that fucked me up pretty hard i will say and it, it was so i guess you know what once again uh splatter naked blood there's a similar scene where a girl um i think she cuts off her nipple and eats it or something like that yeah. <laughs> yeah. and so it's just anything with like with me it's always teeth fingernails and nipples i don't know what it is about <laughs> what about what it is about those three but if you fuck with them in a movie i am just gonna get oh my god i just i just cringe so hard wait Ooh. you don't like the part in crank 2 where the guy cuts his nipples off for no reason <laughs> <laughs> i honestly forgot about that in crank that's two. all i can recall about that's it hilarious <laughs> oh my god uh, an aspect uh, well, i like oh can i go <laughs> yeah yeah go ahead buddy. oh but i i like the the two brothers work just terrible, mundane jobs. There's a very quick shot of uh, Ukamoto's brother working, I think, at a box factory or something. Oh, yeah. They establish that, and he's, uh, Sukamoto is like an insurance salesman, and you've just got all these shots of him on public transport and walking around into this, these, these huge skyscrapers. Yeah, I think yeah. there's this one is... really good montage where it's kind of like he starts walking eventually, but the first part of it is just him going to places throughout the day and it's just shots of him kind of just standing still in the spaces that he's going to so it's just it gives you this yeah. completely mundane feeling that they're just doing the same thing kind of over and over again so when they do get to the gym it turns into that frantic frenzied editing that he does all the time and mm-hmm. so you start to feel that energy i guess that they that they feel while they're there and while they're uh you know, working on their bodies but also you know being violent towards there's, others. There's, uh, speaking of violent, there's a, a part where his his daily routine is interrupted by seeing a, a burst up cat in an alley. Oh yes, God! With the maggots. Yes, <laughs> with all the maggots, it just it disrupts his daily life and it just disturbs him. I love that part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and and Shinya Sukumoto always a dude who's like obviously he holds a shot of that and then he cuts to an extreme <laughs> close-up of it <laughs> yeah, where you've exactly. got the full sound design of the maggots like crawling around Squirming inside around. like the skin so and stuff. Gross. Oh, God. He loves it. And, and even the cityscape shots too because it's, it's not even just that he's like... There's one there's one version of it where Jamie's right like the the shots are very mundane that he's like walking through sort of just like this modern Tokyo he's taking the subway he's walking on kind right. of like highway bridges and things like that and those are very mundane but the sound design is again once again like these very irritating sounds of like the yeah, scratches true. and the and the honking and mm-hmm. the the noise in the air and just everything about it just like kind of like puts you off and it, it really makes you understand that this existence is is really terrible um and and why you know he would be sort of invigorated by something that is very overtly like 
more painful, but at least it's like sort of exciting and he has some semblance of control over it because at least when it gets like very gross with the textures and the sounds and the fighting, you know, he feels like he has some sort of power there, which is very different in the images when he's walking through the city where he feels like just completely insignificant walking through there. Um, but as soon as you get into the actual fighting, um, Shinya really applies like the sort of like expressionist style of it. Like there's just a, a, a shot at one point where I think he falls asleep in front of the TV static. Uh, and it's again, it's just this very mundane thing where he's asleep on the couch and sort of like the the technology is once again being irritating right in front of him. And in his mind, he's imagining his younger brother in like this sort of like blue and orange, like dreamscape with like a fog machine going off. <laughs> yeah. and he's just like punching into the fog as like a silhouette. And <laughs> it's, it's very like a very cool image. Um, and obviously he is a little bit like afraid of sort of like activating this part of himself. But at a certain point he just kind of like accepts it. Um, obviously yeah. one part because he is being cuckold and he wants to win his uh, fiance back and he realizes that she has sort of been swept up and you know, this has sort of um, activated something inside her that um, she's interested in. And there's a scene where they literally just like beat the shit out of each other <laughs> yeah. and they love it. <laughs> it's liberating. That's what, yeah. that's what's great about it. It's just <laughs> violence is disruption. That's what the thing with we the cat is. Doing it's just disrupting our lives. <laughs> it's about how inflicting horrible violence on each other is a very liberating act, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Feels great. Yeah. It does. Well, and, 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 and that's the impressive thing about Tsukamoto is that, like, obviously that feels like a contradictory thing that, you know, sort of any civilized person wouldn't, like, really believe. But his filmmaking does get you to feel that experience. Like, you oh, yeah. do feel better for these people and, like, that they have opened up, that they have become something... Um, and, and they feel better. Like when, when they're done beating each other up and they're covered in, in bruises and they've like scarred each other and they just sit there side by side, like next to the concrete pillar. And they're kind of just like relieved a little bit. They're just kind of like, we got that out of our system. We, <laughs> there's the, something, there was an exchange of, um, pleasure and feeling that happened here even though it was done in a obviously a, a very idiosyncratic way that we'll say um, <laughs> so and and the, and the whole movie basically just just traces that that transformation that like yeah. activating that more animalistic side of yourself and sort of getting out your feelings through the physical activity of boxing which is again something that other boxing movies are very much about about you know uh, but it's just Tsukamoto's style is so completely different than anyone else's version of it, and obviously a lot more perverse and, and disgusting and bloody. Like, the actual oh, yeah. fight scenes in this, when, oh when, when he goes to his brother's apartment uh, and his brother just... Uh, there, he films this super interestingly, like, where he tries to fight him, and then instead of doing... Um, like an actual overcranked filming where they revert it into slow motion. He actually films it in real time and has the performers perform in slow motion. Um, oh, are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. W which you would think would, would be strange. And it is a little strange because um, he's, it's kind of part of the effect he's hoping to achieve, but also like there's nothing realistic about the way that he's shooting it or lighting it or anything like that. So it, it does kind of yeah. just like not come off much weirder. It's super highly stylized in the first place during when it enters the fight scenes. Oh, but yeah. when he very slowly punches him in the face <laughs> and then it, he, he has Sukamoto with like some sort of like, uh, blood sprayer off to the side of his face that just like explodes on impact with his you can, fist. You can hear the hose shooting the blood out in some of the scenes. Yeah. It's yeah. incredible yeah. that they left that in. Yeah, they just start like having every every goosebump that that they uh, that they have on their face. Any any like uh, swollen swollen injury or whatever just starts popping, and it's just absolutely oh. disgusting. Oh my god. So, yeah, I suppose we have to talk about the last scene with Tsukamoto's brother in the fight, his face afterwards. <laughs> oh, oh my yeah. god. <laughs> Everyone in the audience is just horrified, and then we slowly <laughs> just and pulsating we see what face. Yeah, oh my god. Yeah, his, it, it looks like his, like, 
his lips are missing or like his jaw is unhinged and he's like, ah, ah, he's like opening it and closing his mouth with just oh. exposed teeth. And again, and that's he just another... won too, right? It did, yeah, he did. Yeah, yes. and it's like, what a victory to, to look like that afterwards. <laughs> well, and, and, and that's the thing is it's another sense of like, you're missing like the glory because the glory comes with just like, like pure mutilation rather right. than like an rather than like an existential or emotional crisis like in fat city it comes with like bodily mutilation and 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 yeah. harm um and despite the fact that they sort of like feel better about it it's just like Tsukamoto will never let people like get away like without scars yeah, from exactly. one of his experiences that's a good one um, like which is kind of like what makes his makes his movies like very unique when you watch them is that like you know, there there is just so much bodily destruction. <laughs> oh, they all get all destroyed the at the end of this one. Uh, Ojima's face is just destroyed. Tsukamoto loses an eye, and his his wife is just sticking pieces of like rebar into herself. <laughs> oh <my> god! Yeah, <laughs> yeah everyone's just... better by the end of this movie for sure. Oh, they're all better. They're all better for it. Which yeah. is the strange yeah. thing about it. <laughs> They've all found themselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and 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 because and and I think at one point she even she even says something about how, you know, that the brothers like turning Shinya into like a, a killing machine, and the way that they start, he like sort of like textures that is they're like kind of like covered in like sweat and like jelly and surrounded by steel, and they're constantly like drinking alcohol. I think at one point. He he drinks oil like he puts he dumps oil on his face. Yeah, <laughs> it's oil. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So so the way that they're doing these really bizarre things, but his camera, the way that it's again so, the way that it like swings back and forth and jolts around, the, the camera is it feels liberated at a certain point too, where it's just so energetic and they feel so sort of like unhinged and, and sort of free by sort of like the actions that they're, they're taking here. Yeah. Like there's um, one, uh, there's one shot and I think they even end with a shot that's very similar with, uh, the, the, um, the bag. And it's, yeah. it's just like, as the, as the fighting gets louder and louder and you hear the, the, the ring noises and all that, the camera just starts to shake more and more violently. It's like it's becoming mm-hmm. alive. And uh, yeah, that stuff like that is is fantastic. It just, it, it's so engaging and such a cool way to translate what he's uh, trying to say. Mm-hmm. It's similar to that shot with Shinya on the, near the end where he has, he's destroyed his eye and the camera's just going in and out of focus. It's just, oh, right. Oh, there's yeah. some, something yeah. bubbling underneath, you know? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um, I also like to in like the the final fight bit where they're or I guess they're kind of like sparring in the ring. I think in in this scene, but the fight scenes are always done with like a a kind of like dreamier aspect uh, to them in in the filmmaking. Like there's always something that there is something transcendent um, or sort of like metaphysical taking place on top of obviously the actual physical mutilation that they're about to perform on each other. But there's a part where they're sparring in the ring and then it cuts to them both like standing uh, on a roof about to like fight each other because really they're, they're about to have basically like a street fight, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like in, in the ring. And I love that the way that when they start fighting, the camera will like latch on to like their point of view. There's, I think there's, this is the, I don't know if I've seen it in another boxing movie, but there is like point of view, like of fist shots in every, this. Yeah, every single punch <laughs> yeah. in this movie is directed straight at the camera, which I like. It really gets yeah, into or, it. Or, yeah, or the camera seems like latched onto like the elbow, and it like follows through the viewpoint like of the fist as it hits something. Or there's like an insane like over the shoulder shots that are like way tighter and grosser than like the usual coverage for something like this. And yeah, it's just it's just so it's the complete um, opposite of the way they shoot boxing in Fat City, essentially. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. It's it, it's like otherworldly exciting. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, that would be a great way to explain it. Because it does, it feels, aspect. it feels, yeah, it completely feels at, uh, like out of this earth for sure. And that's, I mean, that's yeah. Shinya in general. He, he never like, you know, I was, have you, you seen Snake of June, right, Josh? You said, yeah, like that that's ending with one. the, with the, you know, the, the camera going off and the flashes and all that. Like it, he's just constantly doing something that feels like he's from another planet. Like I, I, he, it's his brain. 
I just <laughs> his mind. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's <laughs> unbelievable. A lot of just melts me. Themes in Snake of June with Tokyo Fist. It's all all of it, except that one's an erotic thriller, and this is a boxing movie. Right. But that's all right. about uh, disruptions to the ordinary life through gratuitous violence, and in that case, sex in that film. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and, and there, there's always a sense that like you should, like there we should be sort of like we are scared in a certain way by by these sorts of things but in a certain way they are freer than like the repressed reality <laughs> yeah. that you actually sort of like live in so there's there, there's kind of like a sense that like he's not necessarily saying that certain elements of these things are good but that they are more exciting and more i guess lively and make you feel more alive than like the actual sort of like uh, modern city existence, I guess, that he was feeling. I don't know what was going on in Japan at the time. Sometimes <laughs> I try to match up uh, <laughs> what they were uh, feel like some, something like uh, like Akira 2. Just all of those anxieties yeah. kind of like fit into um, like a sort of microcosm expressionist reality of it, um, yeah. which is like very interesting. But a lot of these, a lot of these films, films like, like tackle very similar feelings and they're just sort of like less afraid to go to the places to express that yeah so this, yeah definitely yeah. definitely love um Tsukamoto and I mean this one when they get that final fight and the brother wins and he's completely his face is like completely destroyed and mutilated he looks like a monster so much so that the crowd <laughs> can't even cheer for his win they're just fucking terrified and then but they also achieve some sort of like release through this and his i think shinya is like swallowed in to like this like black and white world yeah that's where he is like interesting yeah he's like screaming and bleeding inside like this black and white realm well the brother's jaw almost came straight off and he's spraying <laughs> blood and and everywhere and then they kind of go back to the world that they were living in but he does feel like more free and it does have that like the the cars and the wires and the steel and there is that uh, electricity in the sound design that reminds me a lot of like David Lynch like the eraser head we, we compared Tetsuo oh, yeah. at the time to sort of like the sound design that you would find in something like a, a racer head um and think, the final I mean, shot I think naked is blood just, as well just with the like yeah. you were mentioning the maggots earlier and there's a lot of that there's a lot of very loud, almost unnaturally loud, uh, squish sounds and stuff that just make you yeah, really gross. uncomfortable. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I, but I like that it ends on he's back to his corporate environment. He's back in, um, you know, like his suit. I think I don't remember if he's getting on the subway or something, but he's kind of like standing still out in the city. Uh, but you can see all of the scars from the experience like his face is completely changed his one eye looks like he's blind in it or it's been damaged or it's like discolored yeah. and it's just like the experience that he's felt is going to be sort of like carried with him now back into his sort of like his mundane existence that that he had before he's a very changed man by the end oh yeah i think everybody's been everybody. changed <laughs> yeah <laughs> they've learned yeah, to as, express as, themselves that's the thing yeah, yeah. As as anyone would, you know, either you're gonna rip someone else's jaw off, you're going to tear through their flesh. There are like intense close up shots of like flesh being torn apart to reveal like like a white background. I don't even know how he did that. <laughs> it's a similar thing that he did with Tetsuo in those transitions. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like a stop motion effect almost, the, the, but the, just the, with like yeah. this weird like flesh texture. <laughs> it's strange. Yeah, I love those. I love the opening too, with just the the shot of the arm going, and then it just puts it, the fist just goes into the screen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah for that's sure. great. Just awesome. I love. Um, uh, they but, also uh, do like little things with the coaches. It's it's not as um, at the forefront as it is in like Fat City, but there's a part where it's either the brother or Shinya that's getting trained by one of the coaches, and he even t- teaches them. He's like, "Hey, every once in a while, just sneak in an elbow." elbow to the ribs you know just do it it's 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 all good no no one's gonna notice yeah. that kind of thing um it's it's not as what like i said it's not as uh to the forefront like it is in fat city but it's uh it's still there and it, it once again it's just showing this kind of uh oh. violence and a little bit of uh i don't know if you want to call it corruption but 
that, that goes on between the coaches and the boxers themselves. There's mm-hmm. just yeah, the, uh, there's definitely a little bit less focus on kind of like the monetary aspect yeah, of it in the way sure. that like that, that that like Fast City was doing. But there definitely is like a, a relationship um, aspect, and the way that sort of like again, boxing here is not like a, a hope to like achieve a financial dream. Uh, it it is a hope to sort of like finally take control of your life yeah. a little yes. bit uh, yeah. and, and, and your own body um, in, in a sense because your own body is sort of like trapped so how do you express these sort of feelings that you have when the world doesn't let you you destroy someone else's body or your own body um, mm-hmm. and you see if it makes you feel better and in a lot of these <laughs> cases for these characters it did make them feel better <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, so just go out and beat towards, people up, you know, that's the, that's yeah, the answer. It, that, that's the moral of the story is just, if someone, uh, <laughs> is, you, is an, annoying you a little bit, go out there, beat the shit out of them. <laughs> Challenge go, them go to Michael Douglas match. and falling down, uh, on their ass. Yeah. Rush their <laughs> well, you know what? It is happening more and more. We're getting all these YouTubers that are just like, you know what? Let's just box. So, you know, <laughs> people are solving issues this way. <laughs> This is yeah, how we come together. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but pivoting towards the reductive rating round, this one also gets uh, like a decent to high four from me. I think that, again, seeing Tsukamoto's like really unique sort of like expressionist style with really insane editing. And again, his his really like manic handheld camera style applied to, you know, what is a, essentially a boxing drama. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but really it's, it, it is, there's sort of like feelings that these characters have of being trapped and being inadequate and, and being angry about, you know, things that, that going on in their relationships, but also being again, uh, trapped in both their own bodies and in a sort of like modern industrialized Japan. Um, and they express all of that, uh, eventually by just literally destroying each other's bodies. And Tsukamoto just has to take that to the most extreme, horrifying place, uh, that he can doing a sort of like bizarre sort of love triangle about people who just want to destroy, uh, their own bodies. And they are again, surrounded by sort of like these corporate offices and low angle shots of imposing skyscrapers and, and architectures and crazy intense blues and yellows and reds and in, in, in the lighting and really sort of like delirious um, montages of, of fighting. Um, and eventually they hit a sort of euphoric climax of uh, both like actual sex. Uh, Jamie mentioned the scene where um, <laughs> he pulls out the, the nipple ring. Woo. Um, and then also just beating the absolute shit out of each other and achieving a kind of sort of like tangible release. Um, and I guess sort of an, an emotional one, both from, again, the, the, the structure surrounding them and, and, and their own bodies. Um, and it is a very unique way of kind of getting that across. I don't think there will ever be another movie that tackles boxing uh, the way that this one has. <laughs> yeah, this so, is, a, without a doubt, the uh, most bizarre, most just manic boxing movie I've ever seen, for sure. And, I mean, somewhat movie I've ever seen. That's just That just goes without saying with, with Shinya. Uh, yeah, he's just, he's, he's a madman. It, like, it, and what I like is that he has like this constant, it's almost like a punk rock energy where it's just go, 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 go. Um, cause even in like snake of June, which is more based on, you know, like sex and, and love, it still has all of that crazy frenzied editing and, and all that stuff. He just can't, it seemed to help himself. Like, uh, do you guys know of, of a movie that he slows down a little bit? Is there, is there a movie out there? His remake of, uh, fire on the plane is a lot slower. Okay. You see okay. That I'd just be interested all, to yeah. see him do that. Cause every movie I've seen and I've loved it. I mean, I love this guy's, this guy's energy and editing and all that. Um, but I've just never seen him do anything kind of slower paced, uh, you know, more methodic or whatever. No, even, so. even, even, um, uh, killing his new samurai movie, um, samurai films are usually a little bit more sort right. of like, yeah, for sure. uh, relaxed. He, he applies his style to it still. Like awesome. it's so pretty, it's, <laughs> I love it. it. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible so, movie. It, it is. And, and, and there, 
there are some slower dialogue scenes in in that about sort of like Ronins and and war. Uh, he did a Q and A after the film when I saw it at TIFF, where he basically said that he was just really scared that like there was going to be like a World War Three. So K- Killing is his version of like an anti war film done as like a samurai film. Gotcha. But I also watched a one that was included in his box set called Kotoko, okay, which yeah. is the closest he's ever done to kind of just like a, kind of like an indie festival drama. Oh, okay. About, um, where it, it actually stars. A a Japanese pop star named Coco and it's it's literally her sort of like mental breakdown and experience of hallucinations and how they kind of deem her a bit of like an unfit mother because she's so absolutely sort of like terrified of so many things around her she sees like doubles and she sees like a hostile world so it only really gets like sukamoto e in like the scenes where she's having hallucinations and nightmares and imagining okay. that like people around her want to do bad things to her. They want to hurt her. They want to attack her. They want to attack her child. There's a lot of like child endangerment scenes because she's so afraid about the future of her own child. And needless to say, Shinya Tsukamoto once again has to take like uh, a, a drama about sort of like a mother's mental breakdown experience and he has to take that to like the next level including images of like babies brains being blown out by guns and stuff and just like, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> yeah uh so her nightmare sequences are like pretty pretty next level but like outside of the nightmare sequences it's actually kind of just a typical indie fest drama out of Japan okay that's the closest I've seen to him kind of like not doing like a full out Tetsuo style film yeah because yeah. you would think doing a boxing film you can't do a Tetsuo boxing film it doesn't make sense and then he's like yeah no you can Tokyo Fist yeah and he exists. nails it he did it he absolutely uh, did it yeah four out, man did it four out of five uh, for this one uh, for sure and just also like what a talent this guy is like to star write and direct in a lot of these movies that are just insane over the top bat shit uh, just very, very impressive dude. Um, so, yeah, four out of five for me. For you, Rocky. I give it a five out of five. I think he's... Nice. Uh, yeah. Sukumo- nice. Sukumoto is like a director who's own, like able to do something where he puts everything I like into his movies. Yeah. He's like yeah. got really amazing industrial soundtracks. He's got amazing, very distinct visual style that even other directors were ripping off. Like, uh, I'm not sure if you guys know who, uh, like, other cyberpunk directors like Shozen uh, Fukui, I think it's pronounced, he did 964 Pinocchio and Rubber's Lover. They were all inspired okay. by Tetsuo. Oh, wow. No, I haven't seen those. I might have to check them out, though. They're great, yeah. yeah if, you like, if you like these kind of movies, check out those ones. But he's, he's just a direct... He's he, very similar to Cronenberg. That it's all yeah. about how... Yeah transformation and violence is a very liberating thing and how <laughs> it's it's what's going to liberate us from our mundane lives is horrifying mm-hmm. violence yeah do you know what i was gonna say i wrote in my notes uh, briefly that tokyo fist the closest thing it reminded me to was a uh, crash yes that's a great <laughs> comparison that's yeah it's, yeah because it's it's that people get super horny um <laughs> and and liberated by um, like the destruction of car accidents. So instead replace uh, car crashes with boxing and you've basically got what this film is kind of going for on like a uh, sort of like awesome. character experience level. That's, that's it. Great. Yeah. I love this movie. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right. Well, well uh, Rocky, uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. That was yeah. uh, Fat City 1972 and Tokyo Fist 1995. Uh, if you've got anything that you want to plug, this is usually uh, where we where we have you do that. Oh, uh, well, you can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Viperwave. And uh, if you're a fan of Twitch, I've got a stream called uh, the Kimono Friend Zone. So twitch.tv slash Kimono Friend Zone. If you want to yeah. join us there, we play all kinds of weird shit. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been noticed that you've been playing like some some older horror games and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, cool. I try to find all the strangest things. It's the same with movies. <laughs> Hell yeah! Well, I, I guess know. if you guys like these movies, if you want to see a gaming equivalent, you might be able to find them over on Rocky's Twitch stream. Thank you <laughs> so awesome. much for having me, guys. Yeah, of course. No, no problem uh, at at all. We loved having you. Um, for our listeners, in one week's time, we are going to be back with a uh, bonus episode where we are we are going to be heading over to. Uh, Hong Kong, and we are going to be talking about for the second time on the show. We are going to be talking about Jackie Chan, the boy. We're, 
Ooh. We did uh, an episode two years ago where we did uh, Drunken Master uh, and Drunken Master 2, his sort of sort of oh, late yeah. sequel to it. Uh, so we're going to be keeping in that realm and we are going to be doing um, his other major franchise and pr- actually his, probably his bigger franchise. That he's I guess there's like well five for. of them, huh? Uh, we're going to be doing Police Story and Police Story 2. And uh, these yeah. two specifically are the two that are directed by Jackie Chan. So these are the closest we've gotten to um, sort of like the apex of Jackie Chan's uh, vision, yeah. uh, what he wanted to achieve uh, as a performer and a filmmaker. Which is possibly so talking- kill him and his entire crew, and we love him for it. Exactly. So we're going to be talking about Police Story and Police Story 2 next week. Uh, again, patreon.com slash podcast for that episode. And then in two weeks' time, we are going to be uh, sticking around uh, in, in Hong Kong, and we are going to be talking about John Woo's oh, yeah. Bullet in the Head, um, which is probably my major John Woo uh, blind spot. Uh, but from what I understand, it's some sort of um, kind of like a, a wartime uh, drama about friends who kind of like come back from, from the war. Apparently, it's, uh, it's a lot of people compare it to something like The Deer Hunter. Oh, okay. Um, So we're going to be talking about John Woo taking on sort of like a a drama like that. And then we are going to be pairing it with Wong Kar Wai's Fallen Angels. Oh, I love that movie. Which is, personally, it's my favorite Wong Kar Wai film. Um, I know a lot, obviously, In the Mood for Love is amazing. Chunking Express are both amazing as well. But Fallen Angels is like the closest we've ever gotten to Wong Kar Wai. It's probably the only Wong Kar Wai we really can do, because it's the only really, like, <laughs> non-drama, like, sort of about assassins kind of uh, style gotcha. movie that, that he's done. Um, but it is still a very stylistically dreamy existential drama, but it does have uh, some shootouts in it. Uh, so it counts. And the, the, the way that they're done is very strange and very Wong Kar Wai. And uh, so we're going to be getting very existential in Hong Kong. Um, and Rocky, I think that you had a you had a review of Fallen Angels that <laughs> summed it up like perfectly, which was like this movie captures what it feels like to like late at night be driving to McDonald's at three a.m. It's, it's <laughs> like yeah, it's it's like if Dream Pop was a movie. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. uh, in two weeks' time, we're going to be back with a guest talking about those two films. So look forward to that. Uh, but that being said, I think that'll wrap it up for everything this week. Thanks so much, guys, for listening and keep it sleazy. Keep it Bye. sleazy.